Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to bring you this AMA brought to you by Cryptonaires and Crypto Sensei. I am, of course, Crypto Sensei, your host, and I'm brought to you by we have Hassan here, the founder, and we have Blair, which is also the co founder of Electron Exchange. And we're going to learn a little bit about uh, what these guys are doing right now. First, I'd like to hear a little bit about Blair and then Hassan, if that's okay. Blair, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and how long you've been in the crypto space and, and what, what, what brought you to want to create? something like this electron exchange absolutely well my name is blair the co-founder of electron exchange i've been in the crypto space for quite some time this is about my this is my second bull run now so i'm pretty excited about that one thing that i really love about the space is i love the transparency that the blockchain offers and provides and it allows us to address some of the pain points within different industry in a way that we didn't have the ability to do before and I guess that's what brought me there. I think that it really helps us to go outside the box when it comes to innovation and the way we're able to solve the pain points to keep it. So you saw a problem with the industry and maybe a way that you could fix it and you wanted to, you know, be a part of that solution is what I what is what I'm hearing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. I, I know that Son had been in solar for some time for some time. We had the opportunity to work in senior leadership at a couple of organizations previously and we just did some brainstorming around the problems that you know he was seeing and here comes electron exchange and we're happy to bring it to the table awesome awesome well hassan you're up you want to talk to us a little bit about your background and and why you created electron exchange absolutely so yeah i have a pretty extensive background i've been i've been in the work industry since like 2001 or 2002 i believe so i've been kind of around but majority of my experience came from a, a fortune 15 company that put us to a rigorous leadership training that's where i met blair as well and through you know talking about uh, i'm a finance nerd so i talked to everybody about stocks options and stuff like that matter of fact i used to actually have a youtube channel where i try to educate other people about stocks and options as well but that's i met blair while i was a you know senior leadership with verizon wireless and she was kind of my business partner and we worked through a couple of different challenges we brought a couple of different stores up to performing standards but yeah we started talking about finances and one thing led to another and she started telling me about xrp so i bought you XRP and kind of went down that, that rabbit hole and learned about crypto and blockchain I want to say 2015 or 2016. So it's been a while. I've known her for a really long time. She's one of my one of my closer friends as well. But yeah, we we started talking about it, and I switched industry because I wanted to do something a little bit better for the environment and live a little bit better, something for for my kids as well. So I started looking at where else I could utilize my talents and my expertise and and everything that I acquired with Verizon. And I realized that solar is a great industry to go because they, they're doing something right for the world. They're making cleaner energy and making it accessible to more people. So I was like, well, let me, let me explore that. And I got lucky. I got hired with Sunrun pretty much uh, within a week after I applied, I was offered a job. And kind of like their middle management type of role as well. But as with any new industry, I wanted to kind of go in there and learn the ropes. And as I was learning, one of my one of my things that I was doing to improve their processes was reaching out to the customers that did sign up and then also reaching out to the customers that didn't sign up. And one of the things that I kept on seeing over and over was the sellback rates. So when you buy solar equipment for your house, the utility company still owns any extra electricity that you produce. And they'll buy it from the customer, but they give you like really pennies on the dollar. So that was one of the biggest pain points that I saw from customer feedback itself. And again, Sunrun is one of the largest ones, not the largest one in the U.S. as far as penetration goes. So having that type of feedback consistently being heard was kind of a wake up moment for me. I was like, well, how can we solve that? And I started talking, talking to myself about it, talking to a few of the colleagues as well. And came to a conclusion, I was like, well, transparency is the big thing, right? So what can I introduce that brings in the transparency within the industry that's already there? And crypto is obviously the obvious answer because the ledger is accessible by anybody that has the capacity to see it. And that's why I was like, well, how can we make that bridge a little bit better? How can we make that accessible to everybody else out there? So one of the problems with solar is it's very limited to, to A, homeowners. You can't be a renter. You can't be on a lease. You can't be on any kind of loan or anything like that. So it's it's a little bit of a, a tie down for them as well. So a person that's in an apartment complex, for example, that really wants to reduce the carbon footprint has no capacity to do that with solar. So with the blockchain that we're creating, it's going to give them the access to be able to do that. 
So you can buy clean energy from your neighbor or, or, you know, from somebody across the street and be able to utilize that and reduce your carbon footprint at the same time. So that's why we came up with that. And again, the Blair was brought on because she has a ton more knowledge about crypto space than I did. I'm learning. I've learned a lot over the past eight months. And I'm one of those persons that once it gets in my head, I, I'm a nerd about it. I want to learn as much as I can. Um, so a lot of my times when we're not in meetings or we're not talking to VCs, we're not talking to people, I'm sitting there either picking Blair's brain or just learning myself how I can make this process a little bit better and what we need to do to actually accomplish our mission. See, I, I I love that about crypto. You actually have you know people that are championing causes to go out and fix something, right? And, and using technology to do that. And, and that's what I love about this space. I get to meet really interesting people like yourselves. You know, you guys talked about building your own blockchain. And so I, I had a question about, is that going to be on, on, on a side chain somewhere? Is that going to be like off of, you know, AVAX or something? Or are you guys building your own chain that is going to be maybe EVM compatible so you guys can connect to other chains? Can you just maybe give us a little bit of a background on that? Yeah. So, so kind of going back a little bit to the problem that we're actually trying to solve is to be able to make that energy accessible to people that don't currently have it. And the people that do have it, they can sell theirs uh, to peer-to-peer, to -peer basically, right? I and mean, if you go through like Ethereum, obviously, because it's already established, it's, it's very easy to launch a token on there. The problem comes down to congestion. So right now, for example, the U.S. has close to 5.5, 5.6 million homes that actually have solar on it. If all those people jump on our network, which is what our grand goal is, is to get everybody on board with us. If all of them jump on board and they do one transaction a day to buy and sell, that congestion is going to kill Ethereum and the gas prices are going to kill any kind of profitability that could be there, right? Yeah. So our our research, we actually hired a research company to do a, a couple of different things for us. But one of the things they brought to our attention would be to create a brand new blockchain. It could be a layer two solution. But at this point, I think it's better off from the security standpoint to make our own blockchain, to make it very limited to only handle clean energy transaction. So that way we, we know what the congestion is going to look like. We know what the time frame the congestion is going to look like. And we can offset that a little bit better. We can make it more predictable. The second part of the reason we want to do that is we want to control the fees. If you don't want somebody to pay 1.2 ETH to trade 20 kilowatt hours of electricity, it just doesn't make any sense. So those are the, the two main reasons. But the final reason is going to be the security and the safety of it. Because if you think about it, in the grand scheme of things, people are going to be linking their bank applications to it, their solar applications to it, their utility applications to it. Um, so there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be connected uh, within each other. So at the at the worst case scenario, we don't want some scammer to come in and steal all your all your tokens. Unfortunately, that does happen a lot in crypto. So yeah. we want to kind of stay away from that. So with our blockchain, it's going to be proprietary. We're going to we're not going to have any other coins on it other than just the two for the transaction itself. So there's going to be one stable coin and then one kilowatt hour, basically a coin that exchanges your energy onto the network. So that's one of the biggest reasons that we wanted to create our own blockchain was to solve those four or five issues there. What I wanted to ask a follow up was how long is it going to take you to create your own blockchain? Like, is this been in the works? Is this something that is like six months out, 12 months out? When can people look forward to participating in your electronic exchange? So our early estimates based on our research company is going to be anywhere from six months to 18 months for the development portion of it. Six months being on a on a, on a very, very, very optimistic part of it. And the reason I say that is because for these things to be developed the right way, there's a lot of funding that needs to be done for that. And part of the, the reasons that we're still not in the developing phases because we are waiting for a few different grants that we've applied for. And government grants, I don't know if you've ever dealt with them, but they anything yeah. with government, it takes it takes a while. Yeah. So we are at stage three on, I believe, two different grants. And one of them has already been approved by Microsoft startups. Oh. And that was about 40K in, in approximation of value for that one. But the ones that we're looking forward to are going to be the government ones that are actually going to give us more money. The other reasons that we wanted to kind of jump on this AMA with you guys as well is to kind of get our name out there to get some sure. more private investors out there as well. Because we believe we can raise funds through that and use that those funds to build the chain a little bit faster as well. Depending on how that goes and when we get the grants given to us, again, we're looking at an estimate of anywhere from six to 18 months for the full development of it. Okay. Yeah, I, I definitely know there's a lot of people that watch my channel or that are in my community that 
you know, have gobs of money and, you know, they really love the crypto space. They like, you know, getting into new, new industry, a new invention. And there's definitely those type of people. The first question people are going to want to know if, if they're looking, you know, to maybe invest is kind of what is the opportunity to get into it? I mean, maybe that's a little private to talk about, but is this maybe like a share of the, of the exchange? If I mean, how, like the first question is how much money are you trying to raise to complete your project? That maybe will give some people a good idea of what they're doing and then what kind of things maybe you could offer to people that are, maybe are looking to invest in something like this. Absolutely. So the amount of money that we're trying to raise, there's separate different tiers that we're trying to accomplish. And each tier is going to give us a faster progress, right? So the government funds that are going to be coming in, we're looking at approximately about 500 key that is going to be handed to us, hopefully, by the end of the year. So that's, mm -hmm. that's going to give us a, an X amount of runway. For the NFT sales, what I want to address first is the NFTs are going to be tied to a validator node on the back end of it. So when the network chain is built, you're going to be paired up with your NFT. So your NFT is going to be linked to your validator node. The okay. NFT is going to play two different parts. So one is going to play a part where you can show off to your friends that like, hey, I have, I was one of the founders or one of the early adopters for this particular project. And this is what it is. And the other part is going to be governance. So governance is going to be tied directly through the NFT. So anything that we do in the future. So for example, one of the ideas that Blair and one of our other researchers brought up to us was building and operating a solar farm. So once we get to that stage, we're going to have that on there as well. And the governance will actually help us vote yes or no, if you want to actually go that route or not. So that's going to be a huge part of that. The other part is to, to introduce democracy, right? So the nodes are going to be a limited amount. Right now, the estimate is around 25,000 is what we're looking for. So we're not going to have anything more than 25,000. So it's going to be a limited space to get into it. And the reason we want to do that is, again, because we want to predict what the outcome is going to be for owning a node. So what our initial process is going to be, any fees that we collect from the platform, they're going to be split 80% to the node operators and oh, then 20% wow. to the foundation itself. I mean, that's going to be temporary. The reason I say that is because at one point or eventually our long-term goal is to automate the entire process. So at the end of it, the only split is going to be 95% to the known holders and then 5% to the to the foundation. And wow. the reason the 5% is there is because I'm sure we're going to need some somebody, some text to kind of yeah. make sure that everything is up and running. So that 5% pays for the salary. And again, going off of the numbers, so... Going back to the 2023 results, right? For numbers wise, there's 5.5 million solar homes in the US. So if a quarter of them, so about 1.7 or 1.8 million of those customers end up going on our network, that is going to generate two transactions. So one is when they tokenize the initial electricity onto a network. And then two would be somebody buying that electricity, right? So th those two transactions themselves, just, just those two, nothing else, is going to generate about $12,000 per year per node for every wow. node owner. So yeah, the I I was I was a little bit shy about offering them at such a such a inexpensive price because they're gonna be so much valuable in, in the later future. So in the beginning, we talked with your partners as well. They're going to be valued at a thousand dollars. That's going to be the introduction okay. for crypto. That, that's how much. That's how much NFTs will cost for for the community. Kind of like a pre-sale type of yeah, deal. Is that absolutely. is that what I'm understanding? And then yeah. after the pre-sale, there'll be how much? So after the initial pre-sale, they're going to be twenty five hundred dollars. So oh, right wow. now we've we've been talking to a few different VCs or venture capital firms. Yeah. And what they're asking us is the net asset value of each one of the nodes, and those are valued at twenty five hundred dollars. Okay. So when we open it up for the phase two of our of our NFTs for the second round of funding, they're going to be valued at twenty five dollars or twenty five hundred dollars, and that's going to be the base price going forward. So anytime we open up for more funding or anything like that, or to sell out the last the last big budget of them, they're going to be starting off at twenty five hundred bucks, but they can be auctioned up to be higher as well if if, if there's a demand for it. I have so many questions here, and, and I guess I'll ask the questions ar around the nodes first and stuff like that. Okay. So when somebody buys the NFT, obviously this is they need to wait for the blockchain to launch, right? To start yes. making rewards. Are they going to be able to get like, you know, temporary rewards while they're holding the NFT and where they're waiting for the blockchain to be to be built and 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 activated? Absolutely. So that is something that we've talked about amongst the leadership team and the board members. Some of the things that we're looking to implement is going to be if it's going to take an X amount of longer, like if it takes the full 18 months to develop, then yeah. we're going to use some of the funding to pay back some of those, those NFT holders as, as rewards. So yeah, that's yeah. something that's on the horizon. But again, it depends on how much funds we raise and how quickly we build up the, the blockchain itself. 
Yeah. We don't want to waste any money, essentially. We want to try to get it done as quickly as possible, but we also want to reward our early investors to make sure that they're, we have their back. And can people buy, let, let's say there's somebody out there that says, hey, I know this is a long-term commitment. You know, this is going to take at least 18 months, probably. It would be great if it was sooner, but realistically, you know, 18, 20, 24 months, usually depending on, you know, ev everything, right? And the money coming in. Uh, can people, if they want to buy multiple NFTs, are they able to do that? With, or do they need to change wallets? Uh, how does that work? So changing wallets, it, it may work temporarily. It, it will work temporarily, but within our blockchain, we're going to have a, a way to prevent somebody monopolizing the entire governance okay. so you're not going to be able to you're not allowed to have more than 350 nodes per wallet that's a lot 350 is going to be the max and the reason that is there is because we are going to be using some of those nodes strategically for partnerships with the utility companies and polar companies out there so we're going to give some of those away at the same 250 2500 value so that gives us basically like a buying power or a little bit of a leverage for that but all the nodes, in no matter what we're looking at, no matter what presentation that we're looking at, we've always labeled them at $2,500 base price. So when we launch them on our own blockchain for like the third or fourth round, if you need to, they're going to be auctioned off, but the minimum price is going to be $2,500. But by then, people are going to realize the value that actually brings in. So they're not going to go for $2,500. They're going to go for a lot higher than that. Okay. And you talked, just to back up here a little bit, you talked about there, there's 5.5 million homes in the U.S. with solar, right? And obviously, I, I'd imagine that, you know, solar is is, is gl a global thing. And there's just probably a lot of it's, you know, in the U.S., maybe some Canada. I just, I don't know the numbers, but how do you get the average, you know, maybe person that owns a home that's, you know, 50 or 60 years old to get into your system, right? Like, how do you plan to onboard people that are not blockchain savvy, that don't have any experience in blockchain. How do you get those people onto your electron system to actually start Absolutely. using it? Great question. So our solution to that is having a very simplified electron app. So once the blockchain is built, the electron app is gonna basically do all the onboarding for you. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Mint Money, the app that basically like kind of controls your finances for you. I've heard of it, yeah, I've heard okay. of it. So one of the things that, that we're going to take from some of those more successful apps out there is once you first log into your, your electron app, it's going to ask you for your, either your Enphase ID. Enphase is, by the way, the, a, a, a solar company that, that collects your data for you. So you can either log into your Enphase app or your Sunrun app or whoever your provider is, and then you will log into your, your utility company app. The reason those two are necessary is because they're going to do a cross check with each other to see how much electricity you produce and how much you're sending back to the grid. So that kind of does the checks and balances for you. So the app literally is going to walk you through signing into all both of those apps. And then the rest of it is going to do automatically for you. Our goal is to have it kind of like the Tesla app where you can say every four o'clock or five o'clock every day, I want to sell all my electricity to Electron. Um, so you'll be able to automate that stuff for you as well. No, I'd imagine that'd be pretty cool, right? Like I, I know there's a lot of people, especially in California, that have secondary homes and they travel to and from and they have solar. And so they're not using any electricity in their home, but they're gathering all of that energy you know, daily because... California is usually, you know, really sunny. You know, what do you think? I mean, and I know this is very early, but I'm just very curious, like what type of, you know, income or, or money could somebody make? You know, is this like, I was just curious on the tiers, like, is this, are we talking thousands of dollars a month or, or hundreds or, you know, you know, 50 bucks a month? Like what, where, where do we land if somebody's giving all of their solar and not using it and all of it back to, to the grid? Yeah, so it's a it's a bit of a complicated question, but it is a great question. For that reason, it's a great question because what happens is in California, there's something called a NEM3, net metering. So net metering is what, what dictates the price that you're going to get for selling your electricity back to the grid. And at different times of the day and at different seasons, there's different rates for that. So that becomes very complicated on what you're going to get back from the electric company. But on average, Southern California is where I'm, where, where both myself and Blair are. On average, Southern California, if you have solar, you're getting anywhere from maybe two cents to 11 or 14 cents per kilowatt hour of extra electricity. If you sell it back to the grid, when you want to buy that electricity back, the average California rate is around 44 cents per kilowatt. Oh, so wow. I'm sorry, for per kilowatt hour of electricity. So. It's, it's a losing battle for the solar homeowner because no matter what they do, unless they have two to three Tesla power walls, they're going to have to sell some of the electricity back to the grid. 
And especially the people that have summer homes and, and uh, secondary homes, they're always doing that. So this will give them the avenue to have a better market and be, and I mean, honestly, it's like at the end of the day, you want to feel good about what you're doing, right? So if you're selling your energy to somebody else that needs it, that can't have it for whatever reason. I've been in a couple of different homes in, in, in Arizona and in, in California. And this is the only house that actually qualifies for solar because of the southern exposure. So some of the houses, they have different uh, shapes of roofs, roofs and whatnot. So they, they cannot necessarily have solar. So this allows that person to be able to get clean energy and feel good about themselves and reduce their own carbon emission footprint as well. So I, I love that. I love that. And then, you know, it, just to be really clear, is there any additional equipment required, you know, to, to install for this integration into your system? Or is it just, hey, it, you know, it's already through existing partnerships. Now you just have the app and, and you guys will go out and make sure that every, you know, it's not a huge leap and bound that somebody has to do you because you put like a few walls in, in front of somebody sure they'll tackle the first wall but sometimes they kind of give up on the second and third wall so just making it extremely easy for them to say hey I, I you know i'm connected i can sell my energy back you know what's that process like yeah so again great question and that's one of the biggest things because like you mentioned earlier a lot of the people that actually have solar are in like the middle to to late ages right so sometimes technology could be challenging for that where so again, our goal is going to be to, to make it as simple as possible. Now, outside of the U.S., things are run a little bit differently. Now, some of the countries that we've done research for, they don't actually have the same grid system that we have. They're still running on analog meters. Where in the U.S., most of the U.S. is fortunate that we're, pretty much everybody has a digital meter. So it makes it a little bit easier to tie in. When we start going to other countries and deploying it to other countries, it's going to be a challenge per country, essentially. So this is not something that's going to be done overnight, but especially for the other countries out there. U.S. and Canada, they have a really good grid system when it comes to checks and balances. So those are going to be a lot easier for us to tackle in the, in the early stages. And again, as we have more money, more funding, we're going to be able to deploy it in other, other countries and make it easier for that part as well. So Got it. And, and it does feel like the world is putting more and more money into sustainable, you, you know, reusable type of, you know, energy or wind farms. What has been the conversation, you know, that you guys have had with these kind of institutions that, you know, make all of this money, you know, buying solar back for extremely cheap and then selling it? Like, I would assume just like, you know, text messaging, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, or, you know, long distance calls, they're making all kinds of money on this, right? So they see you coming along maybe to disrupt what they're doing, you know, have they been open to the conversations you have been having about, you know, this, do they want to get on board? Do they want to join and partner with you to make this more accessible to people? Well, you know, what's the conversation's been like? Yeah. So that's one of our, one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face to get utility companies on board with it, right? Because right now they make too much money off of the, off of the solar <laughs> stuff. But eventually, if you look at, so again, we're going to take back to a couple of different other countries that actually offer off grid solutions. So at that point, you can cut off the utility company completely and just have your own sustainable solution in your house, right? That's cool. And now the solar company or the utility company is not making anything off of you. So our solution for that one is having those strategic partnerships. So we're going to go to PG&E, Edison, whoever's out there, especially in California. It's, it's a little bit easier because there's actually a committee that controls that. It's called California Public Utility Commission. So we can just go in and talk to all of them at the exact same time and say, hey, this is what we're looking to do. This is how it's going to benefit the consumer. And this is how it's going to benefit them. So we're going to be offering them an X amount of notes to be able to offset some of that balance as well. And they're not going to do anything different than what they're doing right now. Plus, they're going to have the added benefit of collecting money from the nodes as, as fees as well. So it's going to be another revenue streamline for them. So you see this in the future as somebody saying, you know, thank you, pg but, you know, no, thank you. I'm, I'm tired of paying my $300 bill. I'm going to go use the electro electron grid and I'm going to buy my power cheaper and get it, you know, to so I, I basically can save money. I, it sounds like that's what you're you're trying to do, right? You're trying to really disrupt the the current monopoly system that you know your PG&Es and your big big companies have to really help people save money and energy and and, and time. Absolutely. I don't know if disrupt this is the right word to choose in that context, okay. because at the end of the day, we need we need utility companies. We need pg and &E and Edison to be there and, and support us, right? They own the infrastructure, they own the grids right now, and they own and maintain them for us. Um, so we will definitely need them. Disruption yeah. comes from the other side of it, right? 
So right now, for example, going back to the earlier scenario that I presented, if I'm in an apartment complex and I have kids, I want to be a role model for them and I want to go green, I want to try to help the climate, try to help pretty much every, anything that I possibly do to go green, I have zero options for that. Versus once the electron is available, I'll be able to go in and buy clean energy from, from Clear, for example, and have it in my apartment. And I can show that to my kids. They're like, hey, this is what our carbon footprint looks like before. And this is what it will look like after. As far as what the prices are going to be, they're going to be set by the market itself. So we're not going to go in and say, oh, because you're buying it for 14 cents from here, come to Electron and buy it for 9 cents. That kind of defeats the purpose of that. We want to let the market dictate what the price is going to be for clean energy. If Blair wants to sell me hers for 44 cents and I'm okay with paying that, then that's what the market rate is going to be for that. It's going to be 44 cents. There's not going to be any middlemen dictating that, that limit for it. So... So that's the okay. idea behind it. Yeah, Blair, do you have some you'd like to chime yeah. in, please? Absolutely. I say one of the biggest initiatives here is to restore the trust within solar. So a lot of people got into solar thinking they were going to make some money and that didn't turn out <laughs> to be yeah. there, right. I think that the trust barriers were broken on the customers in and when it came to the solar companies as well. So as we're trying to drive the initiatives for renewable energy moving forward, it's important that we restore that trust and this is going to give us the transparency and the bird eye view that we need to, to have that. You know, you know, I, I was laughing there because I, I, my wife and I had a home in California, you know, about two, two or three years ago and we had solar and we were like, we're going to save so much money on the electric bill. And then at the end of the year, they sent us a bill for like five grand, you know, for over usage of stuff. And we were like, oh man, like we thought we were going to save a bunch of money. That's why that, that, that story just hit real home for me. And it was, it was kind of funny. Thank you for thank you for adding that. That was great. You know, I, I look and I hear people like Larry Fink and, and some of these big CEOs of banks and, and you know, going going green standard initiative, all, all these different things. You know, have you thought to reach out to some of these like, you know, you know, I don't want to say World Economic Forum because maybe that's probably not the right one. But I know I've heard like Larry Fink talk about what is it? SG. What is the acronym? The, this, this cleaner, secure. I, I can't remember the acronym correctly. Do you know what I'm talking about? Am yeah, I, just... I know what you're talking about. So okay. recently, I would say about maybe six weeks ago, six, maybe eight weeks ago, myself and Blair started reaching out to some of these people that are actually in this position. But again, we're, we're small right now, so they don't know us. So it's hard to get a hold of them. However, we have gotten a hold of a few people that are actually in like petroleum and gas refinery programs. Actually, one of the uh, directors for Southwest, I want to say, he's, he's out of Oklahoma. And I actually had a two-hour phone call with them, just kind of explaining to them what we're trying to accomplish and just getting their feedback and basically just getting networking at this point to kind of reach out to yeah. people and telling them what the availability is going to be for this. So, so far, we've had some really good success of just talking to people and just kind of getting our name out there. We're not at that point where we can give them any kind of partnership. So we're right now, it's just more of an introduction. So later on, we can reach out to them and say, hey, we're at the building blocks now. We're going to go ahead and offer you this for a partnership. And we're going to use that to to boost ourselves up, up a little bit. So, you know, the 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 idea behind this is is great, right? We need more sustainable, reliable, you know, companies that are building out different solutions to obviously save people money or offer them something else, right? People having having options is what people want, right? Obviously, yeah. just having the one thing always kind of sucks when you can't choose from, from multiple things. But how are you guys going to, you know, I see this, the solar side of this, the business side of it, you know, how are you guys going to get the crypto side of it? You know, how are you going to reach out to people like myself? Oh, obviously you've already done that, but <laughs> other people like me who may not know you, like, what is the, what is the pitch going to be to them to own the, you know, I, I don't know, maybe you call it EXC token or whatever it's going to be, right? Why, why should people want to buy and hold the token and what added benefit will they get from doing that? Note of it. Okay. So yeah, so real quickly, the token itself, which is going to be the kilowatt hour tokenization of your energy is really not going to have too much value unless you're an energy trader. So if you just sit in there and you want to basically buy and sell from like the difference in the and the pennies or whatever, then yeah, you'll definitely make money from that. But essentially, it's going to have a burn at the same time. So as soon as somebody buys that energy from you, the extra kilowatt hours of energy, that token is going to be burned because there's no no more use for that. Um, so that's going to help the economy of the token itself. So we're not inflating the numbers to be too much out at the same time. And then the other thing is going to be the other side of the equation is going to be all the transactions are going to be done in a in a stable coin. So that way the consumer itself knows that, hey, I'm paying 15 cents for this transaction. And we're just having to do the calculation. And that again goes back to making it easy for the customer to use it. 
So we're going to have really just two tokens on it. The native token, which is going to be the kilowatt hour. You might call it NRG, is what we're kind of thinking of it. And then we're going to have a stable coin, which is actually just going to be a USD or USDT. So that way, again, it's very simple. You go on there and say, okay, I'm going to sell my extra 20 kilowatt hours of electricity for 40 cents per. And it's going to charge me 20 cents for the transaction for you to do that. So I'm going to get this much money back in my wallet right, right away when I get done with the transaction. So again, making it very easy to, to use for the consumer side of it. So you, you could always start using the Ripple stablecoin too, right? The, right. The, you know, I mean, you have one option. So yeah, yeah. No, I my 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 heart, of course, lives with XRP <laughs> and Ripple. So you know, I mean, I I'm an XRP holder. So if you can make that happen, you know, it would be wonderful. I would um, love that. To answer your other question, like how do people like that are not in this energy field? How do they how do they profit yeah. from it? Right. So again, with the NFTs and your validator nodes themselves, they're going to produce a lot of money for you. So every transaction that that happens on the blockchain all of those fees go into one big pool and they all get distributed pretty much i'm not sure what the block hash rates are but i think it's going to be either 24 hours or, or 48 hours pretty much every 48 hours all of those fees are going to be distributed within your electron app so really all you need even if you're not crypto savvy which i think most of your audience are but even yes. if you have brand new people that are just getting into crypto really all they need is the electron app so with the Electron app, you'll be able to say, okay, well, this is my my validator node, or this these are the validator nodes that I have. And pretty much every 24 to 48 hours, you're going to get a little chime on your phone that says, hey, you got more money. We love money. We, we love nodes, especially in my community. I did want to circle back on the node front. You know, obviously people will be able to, it sounds like they'll be able to buy up to 350 and, and participate in governance. I, you know, I did want to ask, you know, usually, because right now there's there's nodes that actually you you know you launch on a, a terminal system where you launch on a you know a virtual private server somewhere and you actually support the blockchain and then there's some projects that launch and you just buy the NFT and then eventually it gets to where you're helping the distributed of the the blockchain so you know when you guys first launch Will the NFTs actually, are people going to be launching these on pieces to decentralize the network? Or is it going to be a little bit more centralized as this thing gets built out as it gets launched? So I'm not sure if I'm able to answer that question right now. <laughs> so there's some stuff that we want to keep our, close to our chest yeah. where to kind of give you a short answer, there's going to be secure servers that are going to handle those for us. So whether they're... Whether we find a way to actually make them secure on on somebody else's laptop, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that's going to look like at the end of the road. Um, but yeah, they're going to be secure. So we're again going back to the safety and security part of it. You want to make sure there's no no misbehaving of anything from anybody outside of our protocol. So, do you know of anybody else in the crypto space that is attempting to do what you guys are doing right now? Or are you guys kind of trying to break the mold. We're, as far as my knowledge goes, we're the only ones in this space or we're the only ones trying to do this. And I mean, crypto is great, right? But it's even when it comes to Ethereum, Ethereum's utility is only on Ethereum is, is exchange. So if Ethereum exchange goes away, there's no more utility for that token. Yeah. So creating something with actual utility it is, is a little bit of a tougher thing to do. And there's not a whole lot of people that are doing that at least the right way, in my opinion. Ripple aside, Ripple is actually solving a, a problem and they're actually creating awesome. their own chain for that. Um, but outside of that, there's really not very many of it. They're, most of them are cash grabs, uh, if I'm being honest. Yeah, you're right. Not that you can't make money on them, but most of them are going to have basically a failing project at the end of it. There are certain projects that can utilize the actual utility. Um, so if anybody's listening out there and they, they have the means to do it, you know, tokenizing your assets, whether it's your U.S. passport, your IDs and stuff like that, those are going to be great for the future as well. They're going to make stuff easier for for crypto to become everyday thing. But as of right now, those are far and few between. So correct me if I'm wrong, but there's not a whole lot of stuff out there that actually uses real life utility or real life problem solving with that one. So yeah, I believe we're the first ones out there and that's why we, I think we need to just build it from the ground up so that way we're not muddying the water with anybody else out there that's doing not the right thing. You're Yeah, you're right. There's a large swath of the crypto space is really either the use cases doesn't exist, you know, or will never exist, or it's it's a scam. And there's very few projects that actually have real value. And it, it looks like you guys are trying to be a real value project. You know, Blair, I wanted to circle circle you in, you know, with your 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 expertise in, in crypto, you know, what kind of help, you know, what kind of problems are you kind of helping to solve with this build out? Like what is kind of coming to your plate every day or, or, or monthly that you're working around and using your expertise in the crypto space to really help guide the project forward? 
to help guide the, guide the project for, I would yeah. say it's really outlining those pain points. And like I said, renewable energy, that that's going to be the future. Crypto and blockchain, that's the future. So we're marrying the two by addressing the pain points on not just the customer side, but, uh, you know, on the electric company side or on the solar side so we can bring them all together. Because the only way that we're going to reach our goals is if we're all on the same page at the end of the day. And we're trying to align those all with our protocol. I, lo I love that, Blair. And it sounds like they're lucky to have you. You know, it's really good to have somebody that's very proficient in, in the crypto space because it is a very complex arena that we are, you know, trying to navigate. And, you know, you sounds like you have a lot of skills that are really helping guide the project. Can I ask you guys what, you know, what else are you wanting to achieve with the project? I know we have the blockchain. We're going to have the nodes and the NFTs to help support the blockchain. You know, are there other things on your roadmap that are important to you to solve after you guys have solved this mega issue that you're you're working on right now? Yeah. So one of the issues that we were talking about long term, like what we want to do after this, like what this, what does this evolve into? So one of the things that's been on our radar since we started talking about this is solar farms. So that's going to be something that we want to do because solar farms are great. I mean, we have tons of open land, especially in the in the middle of the U.S. We can use that to generate tons and tons of power and it's it's interesting because now that I'm in this space, I've been in solar for about three years now. And I was reading this article, I forget what country it was, but there was a country that said that owning a chain link fence is actually more expensive than owning solar fence. And I was like, that doesn't even make any sense because you're 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 flat on the side. You're gonna get maybe an hour or two of sunlight during the day. It it can't value, but when I did the math for that particular country, it actually does make more sense because you're going to get two to three cents per, per kilowatt that's producing. Um, so at the end of the day, at the end of the year, it's going to actually make you money and it looks nicer. So there's a lot of things that are, that are happening in the industry that are actually really exciting because even with the U.S. right now, for as many qualifying homes that are out, just in Southern California, there's 19 point. 5 million or 19.6 million homes are actually qualified for solar, but only about like 1.8 million are actually have solar. So there's a huge gap between like what can be done and what's being done. And I know as we get closer to that 2035 mark, there, you know, things are going to change rapidly, yeah. but it's exciting because like if you look at countries that are actually doing really well for clean energy. So Honduras, Honduras has a 14% attach rate to their solar home. So that's a huge number, right? Because yeah. U.S., which is a really advanced country, and we only have a, like a 4.5% penetration rate. So if you were at Honduras's level, that's almost 19 million houses, four times the amount that we're at right now, approximately. So just from that little change as well, just think about how much clean energy there's going to be out there and then how much, how many more transactions we're going to do on electron. And then how much more money that, that note is going to make you at the end of the year. So a lot of those things are like super exciting because things are changing rapidly and for the right reasons. The 2035 mark, I'm not sure if you're familiar or not, but there's a lot of laws and regulations promoting a use of clean energy, electric cars, and so on and so forth. So when that comes through, I saw a figure something like 50% of California homes are supposed to have solar by, by the end of 2040, I believe. Um, so a lot of those things are going to be really exciting. And this is going to give another reason for those people to go solar is because now they have another avenue to sell their extra electricity to, to their neighbor or somebody down the street and make more money in their pocket at the end of the day. So what do you think is the number one reason why people don't do solar? Is it, is it monetary? Is it, they just don't have the, the knowledge, you know, or know the right people? What, what is it? So out of the surveys that I did with my solar companies, it's, it's people just, they thought it was too good to be true. Mm. Because if I go up to you and say, Hey, you're paying 45 cents for electricity right now. I can sell it to you for 20 cents or whatever for the first 10 years. And then it's free afterwards. You're going to be like, oh, okay, this guy's shady. I don't want to buy anything from him. But there's a lot of money being spent on education, especially in California. And well, Northern, Northern America is actually spending a lot of money on that. Canada has a lot of good programs that actually teach people like what solar does and how it works. And same thing with the U.S. as well. So a lot of the information is coming down the pipeline and people are understanding it a little bit more like how it actually works and where the costs are coming from. And when you actually break that down to the customer, like what the cost is, it, it makes sense. It's a no brainer to have solar on your roof, which is buying electricity from Utah that has to travel 
all the way to California to just be in your house for a little bit. Um, so yeah, the education programs are going to be there. And that's part of our, something that was on our roadmap as well is to teach people like how that stuff actually works on the back end. And, and you know, I'll ask you both this question because, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's maybe some questions that I haven't asked during this, you know, this last, you know, 40, 45 minutes that we've been talking here. You know, is there anything that we've left out or haven't talked about? Maybe I'll go with you first, Hassan. You know, is there anything else that you feel is important that we should be talking about? We've been talking about this for a while. We started reaching out to some VCs, like we mentioned earlier. Some government grants are available to us as well, and we applied for a few of those. And something that I was actually humbled as well, um, we applied for probably close to maybe 25, 30 of them. And I don't know if you ever tried to apply for grants, but the rejection rate is, is extremely high. So there are about like 80 to 90% of the, of the initial application gets rejected pretty much right away. So when I started getting emails saying like, oh, yes, you qualify for this one, we moved you to stage two or stage three. It was actually really, really, really powerful and really motivating to me as well. It's like, oh, wow, we actually made that. But yeah, one of the grants that we actually looked at, actually Blair brought that up to us and it's a partnership grant and their, their sales pitch is that we reject 95% of the people that apply to us. And where the 5% that actually made it to their final stage have actually already approved us for their funding as well. Um, the other thing that I'm really proud about, again, this is all Blair is doing, Microsoft Starters Fund, again, it's one of the harder ones to get into. I don't know the exact percentage on that one, but they've already approved us for, for about, correct me if I'm wrong, Blair, it's about 40K in funding, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so we have a, a lot of things that are like going the right way, basically telling us that, hey, you guys are going the right way. And those type of things like pass on your back are really helpful. Blair owns a consulting company, which is one of the reasons that she was able to do a lot of these outreach as well. And then the research company that we partnered up with, they said that we're the only ones that are doing anything in this space. And right. they're the ones that actually told us which grants to apply for. And one of the ones that we're looking forward to is from National Science Foundation. It's a government grant. And that one is around 275K, I believe, right, Blair? Yes, yeah, about 275K. And that one could be utilized really for anything that, that, that we need at that point. And that's going to basically push us forward to like the next stage. And if you get it, depending on what time you get it, that, that 18 month timeline could be reduced down to like 12 months. Um, I would say the, the smallest one, I would be probably like nine to 10 months on development scale. So a bunch of things that are coming forward for us that are going to be unique to us and they're going to be exciting for us. And we just want to make sure that we can share that success with, with the rest of you guys too. I, I love that. It sounds like Blair, you, you've been really the, the person behind most of these connections. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that or anything else that you would like to cover that maybe we, that I haven't asked that you feel is important? Something that I feel is important to know is there's a new like energy or life that's coming with our new like peer to peer economy. And I think between like the Uber Eats, you have the DoorDash, you have the Airbnbs. And I feel like when you spoke about onboarding earlier, I think that that's going to be another avenue to assist us with the onboarding because everybody's looking for additional streams of income pretty much in this day and age. And if I'm able to pair with the system, I'm going to be open to share, sharing that with my family as well. Of course, they're going to ask, well, how'd you do it? And so you're going to have family showing family how to do it or friends showing friends and I believe we're going to get a lot of traction when it comes to that as well and onboarding people into our ecosystem. I love that, Blair. I love that, Blair. What I'll do is let's let's go you know, around the table with, with you, Hassan, first. You have any closing words or calls to action that you want to tell the audience before we kind of end here today? Yeah, so the closing words are going to be join the Crypto Nurse community and go to their Ultra Bowl channel. Because that's where they're going to have the initial launch for us. So they're going to drop it for you guys and it'll have the NFC contracts in there. So you can go in and buy this. It's going to be on AVAX chain to begin with. It's the easiest yeah. one to work with. But just realize that these NF NFTs are going to be later on transferred to our blockchain. But right now, if you guys want to get in with this project and, and make sure you guys have at least 2.5x to your money, join Cryptoners and sign up for their Ultra Bowl and just wait for us. The NFC should be ready sometime next week. So... Depending on when this video goes live, it might only be a couple of days away. So you'll have some time to, to get your stuff ready with Cryptoners. Rock and roll. And yeah, if there's going to be a link down in the description of this video for Cryptoners community, you can sign up on for the community. And uh, we'd love to have you and participate in this. Blair, I'll, I'll turn it to you for the final words. What? Please close us out. Any any closing feelings or any thoughts that you'd like to share? Yes, definitely join Cryptoners. And we definitely look forward to making some real change, some real positive changes in the renewable energy space. And we okay. definitely... Yeah, you'll join us on this journey. 
I love that. Short, sweet, and to the point. Thank you so much for for guiding me through this. I've I've learned so much today in this conversation, and I know there's a lot of work to be done. And it sounds like you guys are extremely motivated, well connected, and you're you're going about it the right way. I mean, getting approved for these grants where 95 percent of you know people are getting denied means you guys are doing things the right way, and a lot of other people are failing. And so you know, I I, I wish you all the luck and success in the world. We're going to do our best inside of our community to share the word, share the knowledge and, and put this in front of people and see what they think. And I love that you guys are both XRP and, you know, Ripple lovers, because that is really at the heart of, of, of my soul, what I love to talk about, you know, on my channel and in my community. So thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to having more conversations with you guys in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us, man. It was a pleasure. All right. Absolutely. We're going to thank you, Blair. Thank We're going to end here today. I'll hit the end recording button. Boom.